Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Vanita King and I am a director with Michigan Rehabilitation Services. Before we begin today's presentation, please know that presentation materials are available on the ADA 30 virtual events page at www.michigan.gov forward slash ADA 30. During the presentation, please put questions and comments in the chat box. We highly encourage everyone to utilize the chat feature during the presentation to ask questions that can be addressed by our team behind the scenes. If time does not allow to answer all questions or comments, follow-up will be provided after the training. Resources and contact information will be sent to all registered attendees following the event today. Zoom offers information regarding the accessible platform features at https colon forward slash forward slash zoom.us forward slash accessibility or at 1-888-799-9666. If you are unable to access the chat with assistive technology during the presentation, please utilize the resource information provided following the training to address your questions. Today's presentation features Workers Disability Compensation Agency representatives, Jack Nolish and David Campbell, as they commemorate the ADA and explain how workers compensation was the first social program to recognize the value of workers with limitations by providing post-industrial injury job accommodations to return to the pre-injury employment or provide job placement, including training for suitable other employment. Additional programming will be discussed specific to the special funding to incentivize employers to provide appropriate employment. Our first speaker will be Jack Nolish. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Vanita. My name is Jack Nolish, and I serve as the director of the Michigan Workers Disability Compensation Agency. Michigan has been involved in workers' compensation for over 100 years. Next slide, please. For 100 years and more, we've been dealing with situations where in an ordinary workday turns into a really bad day. I've often said that nobody go, plans to get injured when they head for work on a given day, but it happens and it happens a lot. Next, please. People ask me, well, what's the biggest legal problem and challenge you have in workers' compensation? The answer is the law of gravity. Many, many, many of our injuries involve people falling off ladders, lifting heavy objects, and dealing with the impact of gravity. We can't repeal that. And frequently, this is the case. People don't land on their feet. However, we have seen a case where a roofer did, resulting in significant and horrendous injuries to the feet and ankles. Next. What's the story behind workers' compensation? It really goes back to pre-1912. At that time, there were few, if any, social safety nets. Public welfare was often left to churches or social organizations. And although a worker could injured on the job could sue his or her employer in a civil court for a tort action, those cases were very difficult to prove. You had to prove that the employer was negligent and the employer had defenses that the worker was contributorily negligent, that they knew of the danger and assumed the risk or the injury was caused by the negligence of a coworker. Those cases frequently did not result in any compensation being paid to the worker. Next. Going back a little further, the first workers' compensation cases, or excuse me, statutes really were done in Germany under the leadership of Bismarck and in Austria the following years in 1887. It was not until 1893 that the US Commission of La Commissioner of Labor studied the need for insurance 
And that led to the first cooperative insurance law in Maryland in 1902. In 1908, the federal government passed a law referred to as workers' compensation, but that only applied to federal employees. 1911, by that time, some states had a form of workers' compensation statute, and that was hastened by the tragedy of the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire in New York, where dozens of people were killed in a factory fire. Here in Michigan, we enacted our compensation law in 1912, and that was brought about in part because of the confluence of mining injuries that were becoming more prevalent and the rise of heavy industrialization in the lower peninsula where machines were inflicting very serious injuries. In 1914, we hosted the first meeting of the International Association of Industrial Accident Boards and Commissions here in Michigan. I'll talk about that more in a second. By 1921, 45 states and territories had a workers' compensation law. Next. As I talked about the IAIBC a moment ago, Michigan was the site of the first meeting in 1914, and it was hosted by John Kananen, who chaired the then called Industrial Accident Board of Michigan, but he went by the first name of Jack. 100 years later, me, Jack Nolish, became the president of the, Mich the International Association of Industrial Accident Board and Commissions, which continues in its efforts to make sure people get retrained back to work or placed with their prior employer whenever possible. That has been the subject of numerous international meetings. Coincidentally or, or anecdotally, one of the attendees at that first meeting in 1914 drove here from the state of Washington in what we believe was an Oldsmobile, making it the longest distance warranty repair ever done. Next. The mission of the Workers' Compensation Agency is to deal with Michigan injured workers and their employers that are subject to the act. The act first enacted in 1912 ensures appropriate weekly wage loss benefits, medical care, and vocational rehabilitation for workers who suffer an injury that arises out of and is in the course of their employment while providing valuable liability protection for the employers. It's our mission at the agency to efficiently administer the act and provide prompt, courteous, and impartial service to all of our customers. Next. Who's covered? Nearly all Michigan employers are covered. Three or more employees that have three or more employees at any one time, one or more employee for 35 hours per week for 13 or more consecutive weeks. And as of in 2013, employees as described in the IRS 20 point test. Uh, that test is still out there, although IRS has adopted a new one. Certain people are not covered. We do not cover federal workers of any kind, including interstate railroad workers. We have a fair share, believe it or not, of longshoremen cases here in Michigan because of the Great Lakes, which are uh, international waters. Some agricultural workers are exempt. Tribal employees are generally not included, although some can be. Self-employed individuals, family members, leased employees, and independent contractors may not be covered. Next, please. Well, what does it provide for the employer? As we've talked about, limited liability. If somebody is hurt on the job, generally the only claim they have is under the Workers Disability Compensation Act. The system provides administrative adjudication at the trial and appeal level. There are no jury trials, they're handled administratively. And after an appeal to the appeals commission, cases can go on to the Court of Appeals or the Michigan Supreme Court. It is what's referred to as an exclusive remedy unless it can be proven that the injury was a result of a deliberate act of the employer and the injury was specifically intended. Needless to say, those are very difficult cases to prove. As we mentioned before, in a more easily described, the workers' compensation system is in fact Michigan's first no-fault system. And it provides that the employer cannot use the so-called traditional tort defenses, negligence of the employee, assumption of the risk, or negligence of a coworker. Next, please. The employer does have certain obligation to take advantage of that limitation, and that is Michigan is a mandatory insurance state. Every employer must have insurance 
or be approved as a self-insurer or be approved as a member of a group self-insurer fund. Proof of coverage must be filed with the agency and part of our administrative task is to make sure that the coverage is in place. We get approximately 400,000 filings in that regard every year. Next, please. The benefits provided are what I describe as the three-legged stool. Weekly wage loss compensation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Reasonable and necessary medical care. And in Michigan, that's subject to one of the best cost containment systems in the country. And vocational rehabilitation. Next. There is no compensation for pain and suffering, loss of consortium by the worker or a dependent or spouse, and no compensation generally for scarring or disfigurement unless it impacts on wage earning capacity. Next. When is it a claim? The injury must arise out of and be in the course of the employment and involve at least seven days off work. We talk about specific injuries. Those are the examples I showed at the beginning where my hypothetical worker Charlie fell off a ladder or got run over by a hilo and occupational diseases or disablement, typically described as such thing as repetitive trauma that gives rise to things like carpal tunnel or chronic exposure to atmospheric situations like dust, dirt, smoke, fumes, and so on. There, it's hard to pin down exactly which day was the injury, but nonetheless, that kind of cumulative trauma or repetitive activity can result in a finding of injury. Injuries on the way to and from work are usually not included, and injuries while traveling are usually covered. That distinguishes between going back and forth to work and either working as like an outside salesman or attending a sales call in another state or some sort of business related activity. There is no compensation for injuries resulting from the worker's intentional willful misconduct and recreational and social activities are excluded. Benefits may be suspended during the period of incarceration. Next. We have basically compensation based on finding of injury. A personal injury under our act is compensable if the work causes, contributes to, or aggravates pathology in a manner so as to create a pathology that is medically distinguishable from any pathology that existed prior to the injury. It need not be a single event, as we talked about. Prior to the amendments, the significant manner test applied only to mental disabilities and conditions of the aging process. The amendments were added that have added the term degenerative arthritis as a condition of the aging process subject to the same standard of proof. Mental disabilities were further defined with the addition of the following language. And if the employee's perception of the actual events is reasonably grounded in fact or reality. But important to understand in the concept of Michigan workers' compensation is that injury alone does not establish disability. Next. Under section 301 of our act and 401, we talk about wage earning capacity. It means the loss of wage earning capacity. It means the wages an employee is capable of earning at a job reasonably available to him or her. And language was added, whether or not the wages were actually earned, which we'll talk about as poster injury wage earning capacity or PIWEC. The amendments place an affirmative duty on the employee to seek work that is reasonably available and that a magistrate may consider a good faith job search in determining that availability. Next. And here's where Michigan has one of the more complicated definitions of disability. Here it means a limitation of an employee's wage earning capacity in work suitable to his or her qualifications and training resulting from a personal injury or work-related disease. In order to prove that, the, injury, the injured worker must, number one, disclose his or her qualifications and training, including education, skills, and experiences, whether or not they are relevant to the job that the employee was performing at the time of his or her injury. I use my own personal history in, in talking about that. Once upon a time, I was the voice of the flashing blue light at a Kmart. 
the tension Kmart shoppers, that was me. I did that. That's a skill I have. It's not particularly relevant to what I do now, but there it is. Provident, provide evidence as to the jobs, if any, he or she is qualified or trained to perform within the same salary range as his or her maximum wage earning capacity at the time of the injury. Demonstrate that the work-related injury prevents the employee from performing jobs identified with his, within his or her qualifications and training, paying their maximum wages. If the employee is capable of performing any of the jobs identified, they must show they cannot obtain these positions. Next, once that happens, then the burden shifts to the employer carrier to refute the employee's testimony. Therefore, the act now provides a right of discovery to the employer if necessary for the employer to sustain its burden and present a meaningful defense. That it requires the employee to, to disclose all that information. The employee may then present additional evidence as necessary. If the disability is partial, the employer is responsible for 80% of the difference between the after-tax average weekly wage at the time of the injury and the employee's wage earning capacity after the injury. In figuring this differential, we use the new definition that includes what the employee actually earns as what he or she is capable of earning. Next. Michigan is a wage loss compensation system, as I said before. We talk about 80% of the after-tax value, the average weekly wage, capped at 90% of the state average weekly wage. That cap this year is $934 a week. That max rate, by the way, is a typo. Please don't quote that one. The average weekly, uh, uh, average weekly wage is determined to be the highest 39 of the 52 weeks prior to the date of injury. The tax filing status of the worker, including their marital status and number of dependents, does impact on their rate because it in figures into the after-tax calculation. There is no limitation on duration. We talked about the residual wage capacity reduction. Michigan does not use the phrases that you hear around the country in other states. We don't talk about permanent partial or temporary total which are categories you see frequently in other systems. We do have the specific loss that I talked about. For example, if a hand is cut off by a punch press, and yes, it does happen, that's 215 weeks of compensation, even if the employee is brought back to the job. There is a special category of total and permanent disability that involves the specific loss of two or more appendages, or total insanity, uh, very seldom obtained. The total and permanent disability configuration does have a feature that it allows for the rate to increase over time. Weekly wage loss compensation benefits are, however, subject to various set offs. In addition to the wage earning capacity issue, benefits can be reduced for Social Security retirement benefits employer funded sick pay or short and long term disability programs or any other wage loss substitution program that is employer provided. Next. This is the chart that we update every year and in 2020 the state average weekly wage crossed into a $1,000 category again at $1,037.10. That puts the maximum cap rate in $934 for the year or $48,368. There's not many people that are affected by the cap, but it does come into play. So if the injured worker is earning more than $1,000 a week, their rate doesn't go beyond this 934 figure. Next, next slide, please. As I indicated previously, certain things are not included or reduced. No compensation for non-economic losses. The rate is fixed at the date of injury, although we do have a program that Dave Campbell will talk about in a minute called two years continuous disability. And the rate can be changed, adjusted after two years of continuous disability on a one-time basis for certain categories of employees. And we have a total and permanent disability that we've already talked about. In addition to the actual dollar earned, the calculation of a weekly benefit rate can also include the value of any discontinued fringe benefits. 
that occurs when the rate calculated based only on wages is less than two thirds of the state average weekly wage. However, the Workers' Compensation Act does not otherwise protect fringe benefits. There is nothing other than the employer's policy that requires that sick pay be continued during the period of compensation coverage, for example. We mentioned that uh, the benefits can be reduced by employer funded benefits such as unemployment, wage continuation, pension, social security, and any subsequent wages as we talked about, even if those are lesser wages. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, workers comp is the three-legged stool of benefits. I've talked about wage loss and general injury disability. And I wanna turn the slides now over to Dave Campbell, who is the manager of our compensation rules section, rehabilitation and resolution of cases. Uh, Dave, you can take it away. Thank you, Jack. And I feel like there is a way someday that we could utilize your old Kmart experience in the office when we get back there. Well, we'll have to bring back Kmart too. That may be a problem. Yeah. But thank you. I'm ready. If we can, there we go. Okay. So under the uh, medical benefits, you would be entitled to unlimited medical, surgical, and rehabilitative care that is reasonable, necessary, and related to the injury. And related is a key word there, uh, including nursing care, attendant care, uh, medical devices necessary to recover in the home. And it is subject to cost containment rules, which uh, my division is in charge of determining on an annual basis. Uh, and we, um, are, we do try to, we do utilize the Medicare guidelines for that. So we do try to pay at least 130% of Medicare. And that's important only because we, do, we don't want there to be an access to care issue with the physicians. So we do try to compensate them for the uh, services they provide to an injured employee fairly. Uh, there are special rules these days, as you probably can guess, for uh, paying for opioids and allowing doctors to prescribe and get reimbursed for opioid treatment. The employee must also treat with the employer's or the carrier's choice of provider for the first 28 days after injury, and that used to be 10. So that is a change. Uh, so the big question is, what are a couple guys from the Workers' Disability Compensation Act doing here at the celebration of the ADA 30th anniversary? If you're asking yourself that, the short answer is through its return to work concept and vocational rehabilitation programs, the WDCA has been supporting disability accommodation for decades, as Jack has already mentioned, before the ADA was even enacted. However, these efforts were focused on returning workers to employment that had suffered industrial injuries. The ADA has expanded that concept to workers with disabilities in general no matter what the source. So we're gonna answer a few questions that you may have. What is vocational rehabilitation? Must a worker take part in vocational rehabilitation? Must the employer provide services? And what if a dispute arises throughout all of this? Are vocational rehabilitation benefits offered automatically? is vocational rehabilitation important? So there's a couple answers in here already. So are vocational rehab benefits offered automatically? Not always is that the case, but the employee can then request these services through our agency if they are not offered or the workers' comp agency may order a vocational evaluation through a hearing process. 
And I'm also going to tell you why vocational rehabilitation is important in this entire return to work process. So next slide, please. So what is vocational rehabilitation? And you may hear it referred to as voc rehab or VR services. Vocational rehabilitation services are individually tailored to meet the worker's specific needs. The worker and the rehab counselor will work together to decide what is best for developing an individualized written rehabilitation plan or an IWRP for short. Rehabilitation services may include one or more of the following, counseling and guidance in selecting the job suitable, instruction in job search techniques, and help in adjusting to workers, to the worker's own disability now. Vocational assessment, which is an evaluation of the worker's skills, aptitudes, interests, and physical abilities, to decide on an appropriate occupation and develop a rehabilitation plan. On-the-job training, which is assistance in arranging the period of training for a particular vocation under the guidance of a cooperating employer willing to hire the worker after the training period. And short-term retraining, which when necessary to obtain employment, a worker is entitled to 52 weeks under the Act of training, treatment, or service. And then in special cases, the agency may order up to an additional 52 weeks of training. So two years total if needed. Costs of tuition, fees, books, and supplies are paid directly by the employer or insurance carrier. Thank you. The greatest obstacle when the label disability crosses into the workplace is the perceived expectation of unnecessary costs associated with disability. In fact, most accommodations cost less than $250. Work disability plays out as a work disruption that denotes job performance limitations and connotes decreased productivity and increased cost. This is why chapter nine of the workers comp statute is important because it is meant to provide an incentive to employers to hire persons with certain disabilities. Overcoming the hurdle, helping employers see that a worker with an impairment that is a potential work disability if properly accommodated is only a worker or only an employee. Vocational rehabilitation is very important and is truly a benefit to all parties. It can help employees identify interests, skills, and abilities, provide job readiness assistance, outline career objectives, and facilitate successful return to work. For employers, rehabilitation counselors help identify and overcome barriers to return to work, provide ergonomic assessments in the shop, and facilitate supervisor awareness training and decrease disability related costs by helping employees return to work quickly and safely. Vocational rehabilitation services create a win-win scenario, especially when utilized as an early intervention tool. Vocational rehabilitation counselors are committed to facilitating the personal, social, and economic independence of individuals with disabilities. So within workers' comp, we, have, we approve vocational providers to provide services within the workers' comp arena in Michigan. So that is more of the private sector vocational rehabilitation service. Outside of that, you may also receive services through Michigan Rehabilitation Services, which is the public sector. And everything that I'm talking about as far as vocational rehabilitation and the importance of it really can be applied to both sectors. So depending on the situation, um, so the, the issue with um, the cost of Accommodation also applies if 
there's a disability uh, and maybe, you know, from birth that the MRS is trying to help with, that also applies there. The costs remain the same, which is minimal to an employer. But we are all committed to helping the employer see that if we can overcome those through accommodation, anybody can be um, trained to be a fantastic employee. Thank you. So the return to work hierarchy, which also applies to public and private, uh, return to work at the same job, same employer is the number one goal. Return to work to the same job, same employer with accommodations is what we were just talking about. Return to work, same employer, different job could also be possible. Return to work, different job, different employer if necessary. And return to work, different job with retraining, which could be the same or a different employer. Must a worker take part in vocational rehabilitation? So depending on the circumstances of the case, if the company or the carrier offers vocational rehabilitation services and the worker refuses to accept the services, wage loss benefits may be reduced or dis suspended following a hearing. Resolving disputes through the vocational rehab hearing. This forum provides an open, neutral forum for discussing case issues. It allows the parties to exchange reports and other written or verbal comments relative to the case. The injured worker is encouraged to attend, which provides an avenue to vent and tell their side of the story. The vocational counselor is often in attendance to share their experience and recommendations to date with that employee. Mutual agreement among all the parties is the ultimate goal. Uh, this is a process map that just shows how this would work. So there's an application for a rehabilitation hearing that's filed by the employee or the employer if the employee is not cooperative. And this application would be filed to our agency. And this would be when the claimant, which would be the employee, is being paid workers' comp benefits. The VR hearing is held and it's a mediation hearing. And that's why mutual agreement is really the main goal. It is not arbitration. We are not at this point trying to make a binding um, outcome for the parties. What we're, we're trying to do is bring everybody together and come up with this order or agreement that's drafted and provided to the parties. If there's non-cooperation with that order or agreement, another petition can be filed with the agency or if there's agreement or if agreement cannot be reached by the parties in mediation, then a hearing can be held by the director, which would be Director Nolish. And if there's non-cooperation at that point, benefits could be suspended. And that would be a director's order at that point. If that is not followed by either party, then the case could be appealed to the workers' compensation, work, it, now it's the Workers' Disability Compensation appeal, Appellate Commission. And then if that is not followed, if there's an order there and that is not followed, the case could be appealed to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. Section 319 of the Workers' Disability Compensation Act has been in the act since 1942 and that deals with vocational rehabilitation. An employee who has suffered an injury covered by this act shall be entitled to prompt medical rehabilitation services when as a result of the injury he or she is unable to perform work for which he or she has previous training or experience 
the employee shall be entitled to such vocational rehabilitation services, including retraining and job placement, as may be reasonably necessary to restore him or her to useful employment. Now, I like to say that the entire Workers' Comp Act is about vocational rehabilitation because the entire act is really about returning to work. Section 319 is one small piece of the whole statute and the whole act, but really the act is about returning people to work. Thank you. Since 1985, preventing discrimination against workers with Workers' Disability Compensation Act claims. And what this is referring to is section 418.301, number uh, section part 13, a person shall not discharge an employee or in any manner discriminate against an employee because the employee filed a complaint or instituted or caused to be instituted a proceeding under this act or because of the exercise by the employee on behalf of himself or herself or others of a right afforded by this act. So all of that means that if someone files a workers' compensation claim, they cannot be fired for doing that. Encouraging employees, employment of persons with specific losses since 1943 so section 521 of the act talks about if an employee has a permanent disability in the form of the loss of a hand, arm, foot, leg, or eye, and subsequently has an injury arising out of and in the course of his or her employment, which results in another permanent disability in the form of the loss of a hand, arm, foot, leg, or eye, at the conclusion of payments made for the second permanent disability, he or she shall be conclusively presumed to be totally and permanently disabled and paid compensation for total and permanent disability after subtracting the number of weeks of compensation received by the employee for both such losses. The payment of compensation under this section shall be made by the second injury fund and shall begin at the conclusion of payments for the second permanent, sorry, I'm, I can't get to the bottom here. shall begin at the conclusion of the payments for the second permanent disability. Dave, if I can interject there, the, the history of that part of the act is very interesting. It really arose out of wartime injuries. Uh, folks were, soldiers were wounded, had frequently had amputations and to have them come into a workplace where they might suffer another amputation prior to that provision would have rendered the employer liable for a total and permanent disability claim based on the fact that both appendages were gone as provided in the statute. So what the purpose of that act was to actually provide a backstop, as we call it, for employer their responsibility, if they hire someone with an already existing amputation or specific loss, their liability is limited to injuries related to the injury that occurs subsequently. That is the second injury, and it's capped at the amount that they have to pay out relative to that injury. And so beyond 52 weeks after the date of injury, uh, a fund kicks in to protect the worker while facilitating and limiting the employer's liability, enabling these workers in that category to find employment that otherwise just would not have happened. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, good points. Okay, so this slide is, uh, 
encouraging employment of persons with medical identifiable impairments in this part of the statute has been in place since 1972. And this is the second injury fund vocational disability provision. This program encourages Michigan employers to hire individuals with medically identifiable impairments of the back or heart or who have epilepsy or diabetes when these impairments cause a substantial obstacle to employment. Michigan Rehabilitation Services and the Second Injury Fund jointly administer this program. In the event of a work-related injury, the Second Injury Fund will either reimburse or pay direct workers' compensation benefit obligations beyond 52 weeks after the date of injury when all provisions of Chapter 9, which is this chapter, have been met. The Second Injury Fund is also responsible for vocational rehabilitation costs from the date of injury. Uh, this too is an example of a backstop fund. Yes. So what are the benefits of being certified? Individuals with a certified back, heart, epileptic, or diabetic condition may have a competitive edge when applying for employment. So this is truly an incentive for employers to hire someone with one of these disabilities. They bring to an employer their talents and skills as well as potential cost savings through reduced liability. Another important point is that certification through the vocational handicap law does not affect the workers' compensation rights of injured employees or their dependents. So this is a, these next slides are a guide to these provisions within the act. How does a worker become certified? To be covered by the law, employees must be certified prior to hire. Michigan Rehabilitation Services offices located throughout the state issue vocationally handicapped workers certificates. To be eligible, a worker must have a back, heart, epileptic, or diabetic condition, be unemployed at the time of certification, not have a current offer of employment, and meet one of the following three criteria. The person was turned down for a job for disability-related reasons, is unable to return to work for a previous employer for disability-related reasons, or is a current client of either MRS or the Michigan Commission for the Blind. So the applicant must complete an application form, have it signed by the employer who did not hire or could not hire, rehire the worker for disability related reasons and provide medical information documenting the existence of the disability. Applicants with a qualifying condition who are current clients of MRS or the Michigan Commission for the Blind may be certified without obtaining an employer's signature. Eligibility for these programs is accepted in lieu of being refused employment for disability related reasons. All other certification requirements still apply. That's important to note because um, Employers are a little hesitant to sign off on that, especially with ADA now. So the employer does not want to basically say that they didn't hire someone because they had a disability. So we used to get a lot of these certifications and we don't as much anymore. Uh, just to be honest, because of that issue. Um, the worker's certificate is a wallet-sized card that informs prospective employers that a worker has met the requirements of the vocationally handicapped law. It enables the worker to begin work immediately pending employer certification. The card can be renewed every two years if the individual continues to meet the requirements. Employers should check to see if a job applicant's card is still valid at the time of hire. What is the responsibility of the employer? Employers must complete the certification process by 
filling in and returning to MRS form RA-4476 for each new certified worker they hire in order to receive the benefits of the vocationally handicapped law. The certification process cannot be completed if an employment relationship has existed between the person and the same employer in the 52 weeks prior to the date the employee certificate was issued. Certification is permanent for each certified worker who works continuously for the same employer. However, if a certified worker leaves the place of employment for any reason for a year or longer and is then rehired by the same employer, a new RA4476 form must be completed by the employer. Employers should request this form from the MRS field office that issued the worker's certificate. Employers are required to file the form with MRS within 60 days of the first date of employment. However, employers will be protected under Chapter 9 even if they file after the 60-day period as long as filing takes place before an injury occurs for which benefits are payable under the Workers' Disability Compensation Act. However, failure to follow correct certification procedures may jeopardize an employer's right to Chapter 9 benefits. This is our contact information should you want to follow up with any additional questions that haven't been answered in the chat room today. Thank you so much, Jack and Dave, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we're going to have a live Q&A, so the chat box is now open for questions. Do we have any questions? So this is Mark, and I did leave one question out there to be answered live. I had answered a couple of other questions, and uh, I'll throw this out to Jack or Dave. Uh, the question re deal dealt with medical insurance. I think it deals both with uh, retirement, what happens at the time of retirement, and uh, really with regard to the injury. So how does medical insurance work when an employee leaves state employment, or I think, or any employment in terms of retirement? Uh, is there a certain number of years needed in order to maintain any percentage of medical insurance coverage? Uh, either well, I for state, I'm sorry. For state employees, yeah, there's a whole chart about how long you have to be at work before retirement in a percentage of uh, the premiums that you pay or the state pays in the retirement, none of that is really involved in the Workers' Compensation Act. It becomes a, a question of how the employer, whether it's the state or any other, uh, counts workers' compensation time as seniority time for retirement benefits, including extending medical insurance. But in terms of somebody being injured on the job, and then being off permanently, uh, they're entitled to lifetime medical, whether they retired or not. And it's tied into the Workers' Compensation Act. There are other fringe benefits that is employer funded or employer contributed health insurance or whatever could be figured into the value of the, the calculation done for the average weekly wage but in terms of the medical coverage itself being a factor in the compensation case otherwise, no. Uh, most health carriers, by the way, do not cover work-related injuries. Uh, the state being a little different because everything is a self-insurance program. The state is the carrier administered through various entities. But having said that, uh, really the question of whatever health insurance, whatever premium might be paid in the general employment package is not part of the Workers' Compensation Act. And I didn't want to, I want to loop back around to a question that we received. I did post an answer, but it's a probably a little bit of a limited answer and it's a broad based question, but I think it's certainly relevant in the current era that we're working in and in nature of the gig economy. And it talks about uh, the question specifically was, do you see the continued growth of the gig economy and the rise of independent contractors as a large segment of our labor force, as a threat to the effectiveness of the workers' compensation system, does the system work as well when large segments of the labor force are not in the system? 
and what can we do to protect the system's effectiveness and reach. Uh, I did respond by talking a little bit about uh, independent contractors versus employees in some other areas of the country where they've expanded the definition of worker and specifically a fund in, in New York, the, the Black Car Fund. Uh, but Jack, I thought I'd throw that to you to uh, talk a little bit about also maybe vision for the agency. Sure, well, in terms of the system itself, uh, we address employees that are employees that are injured on the job. Somebody can be an independent contractor or working in the gig economy like Mark was talking about, and they may well be outside of our system. Uh, consequently, they run into problems. Somebody injured while performing work at their home, which obviously is a very growing area of concern right now, may or may not be covered under the Workers' Compensation Act. If they're, first of all, if they're in fact working as an independent contractor, they're not covered. And the whole question about off-site working at home injuries is all over the map in terms of litigation. You know, whether it's something obvious, uh, like they're doing some sort of light assembly in the home environment that causes carpal tunnel, that might be one set of facts. Uh, but if they're working at a desk and decide to go get a soft drink from the refrigerator and trip over Fluffy, the cat, that's quite another situation. Uh, in terms of impacting the system itself, obviously, if there are fewer employees categorized under the Workers' Compensation Act and fewer claims being filed, the system will shrink or adjust accordingly. The long range prospect is yes, indeed, for growth of the independent contractor gig worker. And that's the reality of the marketplace today. And the workers comp world will respond accordingly. So we also received a question about PIWIC and how that is determined and uh, specifically with regard to education or skill level. And uh, Jack, as you know, this is a uh, a topic mile wide and a foot deep. So um, just throwing that back at you there, if you want to talk a little <laughs> bit more about uh, post-injury wager and capacity and how that's determined. Sure. Well, part of it is a detailed analysis of the individual worker's past background. I mentioned my own checkered career as an announcer at a Kmart. Uh, you have to take into account all the kinds of skills that are out there. And that, quite frankly, is a new role of the vocational rehabilitation specialist in terms of doing an in-depth assessment of the individual's capacity. Then that flows into the overlapping area of finding other job opportunities that might be out there in realistic numbers or exist in a reasonable driving distance uh, in assessing whether or not that worker with the restrictions might be able to do that job, then it's a question of whether or not they actively search for it, whether or not the job is reasonably open to them. So yeah, that is an area that is recently in the law and we're just starting to see the impact of it. We've always had a recognition of partial wage capacity and that is where an injured worker was making 500 a week is now making 300 a week compensation for that differential. Let's see, when an employee is- there I posted about a going to and coming from. When in their personal goes, car. Yeah, there you go, yeah. you want to go to? <laughs> yeah, okay, law school 101. Yeah. Okay, the short answer is these are very fact dependent determinations. The use of a personal car as opposed to a motor pool or employer funded car is just one of the factors that might be involved in that. And then it gets even crazier if the worker in route to whatever work purpose they did decided they had to stop at the grocery store at some point. And all these things are very fact intensive determinations. Yes, auto insurance workers or no fault in Michigan is subordinate to workers comp. So you will see in most claim forms from your doctor, is this a work-related injury? Was this an auto accident? All of those things go into that. So primary is if, if in fact the travel was work-related, the comp coverage is primary for both wage loss, rehab, and medical. And then the no-fault carrier might kick in if the compensation rates are different. 
they have different standards for uh, chore services and other features in an auto accident. Yeah, it's a complicated situation, very fact intensive. And the short answer is yes to both questions. So I don't see any other questions posted that we received. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you all for attending today and please consider joining us for our event next week, which is October 29th, hosted by MEDC and MIOSHA. Remember, registration is required. You can register at www.michigan.gov forward slash ADA 30. And if you've missed any of the previous events, please visit www.michigan.gov ADA 30, where you can view videos and the resources uh, from the past. Uh, we'd also like to thank all the panelists again for providing their expertise during today's session. Uh, thank you to the Department of Leo and Economic Opportunity. Thank you to our AFL uh, interpreters, Toy Bogdan and Tamara Wright. And today's virtual session and captioning has been graciously coordinated by Annette Blau of Q&A Reporting Inc. If there's nothing further, uh, we're going to conclude our session and we thank you all again for attending. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome.